Is YouTube as we know it in danger? This is Mr. Beast's one versus one million dollar plane ticket video. A video carefully crafted, prepared and executed. The video became the winner that ended up being created while a hundred other ideas got tossed in the bin. An attempt in pressing Command C on the keyboard, but when he pressed Command V, the copy turned out to be cheap and insignificant. Paradoxically, the video from the Stokes twins got a humongous amount of 12 million views for that stolen video. It's nothing compared to Mr. Beast's 338 million views, but it goes to show that stealing ideas works unfortunately. In this specific case, the Stokes twins stole not just the thumbnail, but the whole video idea, the title and even the execution. This is not the first time this has happened. And I'm not talking about the Stokes twins stealing from Mr. Beast in other instances. They did. But I'm talking about YouTube as a whole. I'm talking about the history of YouTubers and the rest of the world stealing content. One would think that stealing content is the anomaly, something that shouldn't happen. But when you inspect further, you realize that even the most creative YouTubers steal ideas from time to time. Or did you think that Mr. Beast has never done that before? The forbidden fruit on YouTube is simply stealing ideas. And just like Adam and Eve, many YouTubers simply cannot resist to taste it. This raises the question, if content theft continues at this rate, is YouTube going to become a relic of the past? In Austin Kleon's book, Show Your Work, he speaks about a thought experiment called the elevator test to determine if you hypothetically stepped in an elevator with a creator you took something from, would you feel discomfort that that guy would punch you? If yes, that would indicate that you stole in a bad way, which is why the original creator has the moral high ground to be angry. This test is genius because it does reflect the frustration one might feel when you are being copied. In June, pop artist Andy Warhol is shot and critically wounded by a disgruntled would-be actress named Valerie Solanas, who tells Jim Gash in this necessarily censored tape. Valerie, why did this happen? The most extreme version of what can happen if one person copies another is the Andy Warhol case. Andy Warhol was America's most famous artist and Valerie Solanas, a colleague of his, thought that he stole her ideas. One day in 1968, she walked up to him and shot him multiple times. Lucky for him, the attempt was unsuccessful and he lived another 19 years. It goes to show that we humans really do have a drive to be unique. We don't like to be imitated. But for us to understand the counter desire that leads YouTubers to steal and imitate from other YouTubers, we need to look at the early days before YouTube was created. The time of the early internet. In the 1990s, YouTube was at least 10 to 15 years away before it would be created. But in this time, online communities, forums and video sharing platforms would emerge. Smart people at the time could already read between the lines that there is a general desire for people to copy and distribute intellectual property. That's why the internet's earliest manifestation of copy culture became reality. Napster became the place where you would download music for free and the music industry did not like it. It became one of the most infamous cases of copyright infringement in the world and the guy who invented the platform somehow got away with it with a slap on the wrist without any jail time. When Napster shut down in 2001, we were at the point where all the explosive ingredients now were laid out on the table. Communities, user-generated content, the desire to copy and share, protected work and early meme culture. And four years later, ironically on Valentine's Day, Steve Cheng, Chad Hurley and Jawed Karim took these four core desires of people and channeled them into a product so impactful that it revolutionized online video sharing forever. YouTube was born and with it its inherent problems. 
the early days of YouTube, content creation was still finding its footing, and there were instances where people stole content from other sources. This was partly due to the lack of clear guidelines or enforcement mechanisms for copyright infringement. One common practice was re-uploading content from television shows, movies, or other online sources without permission. Users would download videos from these sources and then upload them to their own YouTube channels, sometimes claiming them as their own or simply sharing them with a wider audience. Additionally, there were cases of people re-uploading popular videos from other YouTube creators without permission. These copycats often attempted to capitalize on success and popularity of these original videos, sometimes even getting significant views and attention themselves. As YouTube evolved and grew in popularity, the platform implemented stricter copyright policies and enforcement measures to combat content theft. Copyright holders gained more tools to report and take down infringed content, and YouTube introduced systems such as Content ID to automatically detect and manage copyrighted material. I still remember the good old days where you could watch two entire seasons of Naruto on YouTube. It was due to this that my English grades in school back then went up significantly. At the early days of YouTube, the first creators emerged like Smosh, Nigahiga or Ray William Johnson. And at the time, people were arguing if Smosh copied certain humorous aspects from Nigahiga, Smosh and Higa were finding each other in a similar situation as Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci. They were all on top of their game, which meant the only inspiration they could draw from is each other as rivals. And even though there are no proven cases where any of those people plagiarized from their rivals, it is safe to say that they all have been heavily influenced by each other at least. But in the case of Ray William Johnson, it is quite clear. At the time, he had a format on YouTube where he took three clips out of the internet that he presented in his videos. In between, he would make an edgy joke here and there, but beyond that, it is pretty clear that he was one of the first cases where a YouTuber took content from other people that he himself did not own. It isn't uncommon for humans to take things we like and make it our own. The problem begins when we just simply take and do not make it our own. This has happened to many famous people around the world. Democratic presidential candidate Joseph Biden today faces a controversy. Three weeks ago at a debate at the Iowa State Fair, he used phrases identical to those delivered by British Labour Party leader Neil Kinnock. Joe Biden in 1987 plagiarized parts of his speech from a British politician. In that year, Biden tried to become the president of the United States. But this plagiarism scandal forced him to withdraw from the race in shame. Vladimir Putin was facing allegations that his doctoral thesis in parts were plagiarized because parts of it were copied from other sources without proper attribution. And in 2015, Robert Thicke and Pharrell Williams got sued for copyright infringement for their song Blurred Lines. It was very similar to the song Got To Give It Up by Marvin Gaye. Copying, stealing and taking content from others seems to cross over on all aspects in human life. But the ironic thing is that copying others is the one strategy on YouTube that won't make YouTubers successful long term. The reason for that is novelty. The human brain craves new experiences, ideas and connections it can make. Riffing off of somebody else's video will never lead to similar success to the original and the reason for that is obvious. Once somebody executed on that new idea, it instantly becomes old. And when you watch a video, your subconscious mind remembers if you have seen something similar before. And if it did, it will feel less excited. Being the carbon copy of somebody else can never lead to the success of the original content. A strategy that 99% of people use can't possibly produce the result of the top 1%. But nonetheless, stealing on YouTube is incentivized by the algorithm. Because when one copycat succeeds, others see it as proof that this indeed is the way to move forward. A YouTuber is an actor, producer, writer, director, organizer or data analyst all at once. Therefore, to save time and maximize success, many YouTubers cut short the creative process to just see what works. The logic seems sound, but in reality it is flawed. Because just because an idea has already performed well on YouTube doesn't mean that the fleeting desire for that specific thing is still there now. I'm not saying that copying others is wrong. On the contrary, parts of an artist's journey is imitation of others. The early days of Michael Jackson, who influenced a whole generation and is as famous as Jesus Christ himself, imitated James Brown. Eminem imitated Tupac and Steve Jobs stole most of his ideas from Zen Buddhism to produce minimalistic products. There's no shame for any YouTuber to want to go viral. The truth of the matter is, you can be super creative in your videos and still see no success on your videos. 
That's why it is quite essential for many aspiring creators to imitate in order to understand the rules of the game. Fortunately, most creators never break out of the copycat phase and therefore never break through to real YouTube success. This in fact is a phenomenon you can see across all industries and facets of life. The iPhone, for example, is the pinnacle of phones since 2007 and ever since it dictates the look and technology 90% of competitors imitate. The funniest example is the iPhone with the notch. It looks ridiculous. There was even a commercial that mocks it. But companies are scared to do their own things, so they even end up copying the bad ideas to get a small share of the pie. Social media platforms imitate and steal from each other. Instagram stole stories from Snapchat. TikTok became popular. Instagram and YouTube stole the idea and create reels and shorts. And cats imitate baby voices. Oh, and remember when The Weeknd had this peculiar looking haircut? He stole that from the world famous artist John Michael Basquiat. Everybody imitates. This does not answer the question why YouTubers blatantly steal content though. The answer is quite frustrating. It's proof of concept. Every YouTuber goes through the phase from YouTube being a hobby to it becoming a profession. YouTubers get existential fear of losing everything as soon as their numbers take a small dip. I know that I felt that way for a long time. Using YouTube as a catalog of what works and what you can copy gives you the illusion of security that the next video will perform well, even though that is inherently flawed in its logic. And because everybody does it, it seems like the thing to do which is exactly why it is the wrong strategy to grow on YouTube. But there is a deeper problem why YouTubers tend to steal ideas. Most people believe that they are not creative, including some of your favorite YouTubers. That one teacher that laughed at your drawing of a donkey was enough to shake your beliefs about your creative powers. To be honest, that's why I killed any intuition I had to finally create my first song and make it a music video. I even took singing lessons for three years just to throw in the towel. My trust is gone, I was too blind to see. When I checked your phone, I was scared to be A restless soul laid me down on my knees Another problem everybody faces is starting from a blank canvas. Paradoxically, if I told you to draw me something creative on paper, you would hesitate and the challenge seems so much bigger than if I restricted your options and said, draw a pink star that looks goofy. Boom. Patrick. Anyone who has ever created something has stood in front of a central question that haunts any creative endeavor. Where do you draw the line between inspiration and theft? And do truly original videos on YouTube actually exist? Think about it this way. The only reason somebody calls something truly creative is when they don't know the components or sources that they drew from. So as long as the final video has no similarity to something else, it's creative. As you can see, the definition is deeply flawed. So maybe we get closer to the matter by dissecting the different levels of creating content. Number one is inspiration and number two is remix. <laughs> In the 1970s, hip-hop was invented through sampling different pieces of music together. Without remixing, we wouldn't have hip-hop. The next level of creation is blatant copy. This is what most people do on YouTube. Monkey see, monkey do. The end result is usually a worse version of the original. But there are two more types of creation. Both are either illegal or deeply shunned in society. The first is plagiarism. That happens every time you copy a source and make it look like your own. That often happens in doctor thesis, like in Putin's example, when you don't attribute where you have the information from. But we could make a case that people plagiarize every day on YouTube. The last type of creation is the original fake. Those are pretty rare. The only contemporary case of somebody choosing this type of creation is the now world famous art forger Wolfgang Beltracchi. Coincidentally, the guy lived in my neighborhood and I was wondering why he had this huge mansion. A year later I had my answer. He was all over the news worldwide. He used the forbidden type of creation. What he did was recreating long lost art pieces and sold them for millions as originals. He was so elaborate that his wife dressed as the grandmother and posed for a Polaroid picture. 
so he could show the art specialist that he found the picture in his grandmother's basement. That worked so well until one day he picked the wrong type of white color in one of his art pieces which tipped off the art specialist. He went to jail for 4 years and now his own art pieces are worth over $50,000 per piece. This is bad news for the future of YouTube. So many examples where stealing and copying seems to pay off from time to time. Why wouldn't you just do the same? After all, we all have the right to at least try to be rich, right? This brings us to another intrinsic problem of creativity and content theft on YouTube. YouTubers have the job of seven people at once. You have to be a content machine while being creative. And this is the complete antithesis of that. Creativity comes from counterintuitive, slow and careful consideration. Nonetheless, out of that slow, careful process emerged the first species that we today call I, Barack Hussein Obama, do solemnly swear Bitcoin. And, and it's a very, very sad news that deserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So Michael Jackson has died. Hey, Apple, what? Can you do this? No, 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 no. With the emergence of Shane Dawson, Annoying Orange or people like Jenna Marbles came the first anti-measure of content theft in initiated by YouTube. The first version of the content ID system was officially implemented and posed a serious threat to people that infringed on copyrighted material. Before this moment there was a tension between creators wanting to monetize their content and YouTube that didn't have the means to yet implement such a system. South Park even made an entire episode about it, but eventually YouTube did it and introduced its first version of monetization for selected creators. Unfortunately, the system was so young and flawed that fraudsters in the early days falsely claimed videos they did not own to steal other creators' AdSense revenue. Aside from this, the lines between theft and inspiration is blurred. Is it enough to burp on camera and add that to a fully copied clip you don't own? In its entirety, nobody else has done that before. But does that already count as transformative? Is that new? Where do you draw the line? This question was gonna be answered later down the road during the golden age of YouTube, when two famous YouTubers you all know had to face a legal battle. But not just YouTubers have to face legal battles. In the career of any successful creative person, you will face some sort of legal trouble. The author of Harry Potter was accused to have copied somebody else's work <laughs> named Larry Potter. I'm not making this up. The case was later dismissed because the evidence was deemed unreliable. J.K. Rowling was accused to have stolen the storyline of Harry Potter several more times and it became an internet myth that she stole the storyline from Star Wars. And even though there are convincingly strong connections between the two, what if it all was just a coincidence? Two people? independently from each other, creating the same thing. Just like Alfred Wallace Russell, who invented the theory of revolution around the same time as Charles Darwin. Or Alicia Gray, who filed a patent for the invention of the telephone, but unfortunately ended up being the second person after Alexander Graham Bell to have filed for that patent the same day. And of course, the person who invented the special relativity with the most famous formula E equals MC square. Albert Einstein and Henri Poincaré who independently came up with aspects of that same theory. Speaking of double creations, I'm literally editing the video you're watching right now and I just realized someone has the same idea and a similar thumbnail to the thumbnail you just clicked on for this video. Quite ironic that when I talk about double creations that two people make the same thing independently from each other is the moment when it happens to me. And one of the coincidences where multiple people at once came up with the same idea on YouTube are ASMR videos. It is astounding that at the same time multiple people thought whispering into microphones as the core part of their content has a broad appeal. Around the same time reaction channels emerged although their attribution is much more clear. The Fine Bros made their first reaction video with people reacting to stuff and at the time all of YouTube started copying the exact format. Just as you would expect. The mistake the Fine Brothers made at that point was that they thought they could license their react format which would have resulted in every YouTuber in the world who would use the word react in their videos had to pay a small fine as a licensing fee. 
they knew that everybody is going to steal their format, so they thought that at least they would get a piece of the pie when that happens. At the time, this became one of the biggest controversies in internet history. At the peak of the controversy, the main YouTube channel Fine Brothers Entertainment today, renamed to React, reportedly lost over 600,000 subscribers within a week. Additionally, their subscriber count continued to decline over time as a result of the negative publicity and backlash from the YouTube community. Ultimately, the backlash prompted the Fine Brothers to backtrack on their licensing plan and they issued an apology in an attempt to mitigate the damage to their reputation. However, the incident serves as a cautionary tale about the potential consequences of missteps in content creation and business decisions on YouTube. It goes to show that licensing absolutely simple ideas like the word react is a terrible idea. We screwed up with how we originally talked about this. First and foremost, we're sorry for confusing people by using terminology like our react format. We were never trying to say that every video or someone reacts to something else is something we would try to control. When we referenced licensing the react format, we only meant our specific series, not the overall genre of reaction videos. We do not own the genre. Oh, Jesus! And with this incident, the floodgates of YouTubers copying this format was wide open. YouTube went through its biggest change yet. New types of content, more copycats and another attempt of YouTube stopping people to game the system by changing the algorithm from favoring clicks to favoring watch time. Suddenly hundreds of thousands of creators on YouTube emerged. The golden age of YouTube was the time PewDiePie reigned as a world number one. PewDiePie achieved that milestone through Let's Play videos. And when you think about it, aren't games also copyrighted? If you had that thought, then you are correct. At the time, game developers didn't know how to react to the fact that these kids use their games that they put thousands of hours in just to make lots of money by playing their games. But the consensus and the smart solution became to just see these videos as promotion and let them happen without taking creators' monetization. But then there was Nintendo. Nintendo was worldwide the only company that said no, we do not like the fact that YouTubers basically steal our content and monetize it. Up until 2013, if you did a let's play on a Nintendo game or if you used a one second clip on anything Nintendo, Nintendo the company would be so cutthroat and claim 100% of that video's revenue. This became so unattractive for most creators that they ditched Nintendo's games as a let's play option altogether. Luckily Nintendo had a change of heart when they saw their numbers decline and changed their monetization tyranny to just 13.5% cut if you play their games. That is, if you jump through the hoops of applying to the Nintendo Partner Program, get accepted and get every single video that you make approved by them. This extra level of surveillance and cheap attempt to control what creators do with their content ended up being so inconvenient that many creators still didn't want to play their games. And with Nintendo's final change of heart in 2018, they miraculously decided to ditch their unnecessary partner program and basically let creators do whatever they want without interruption or taking any revenue from them. Unfortunately, Nintendo at this point was still very strict about people making fan projects. To them, if you make a fan-made Pokemon game, you stole their content and therefore have to pay millions. But who knows, maybe one day they come to realize that this too is a mistake. And with that, the last opposing force that tried to stop Let's Play YouTubers from stealing gaming content has fallen. Let's Play YouTubers from this point on could do and play whatever they want. The image of the screaming boy with a microphone in their face became an image intimately linked to the idea what a YouTuber represents. They are twins who became YouTube stars by pulling pranks, but cops say this time they went too far. This prank is backfiring badly for these two brothers. Now 23-year-old twins, Alan and Alex Stokes, are facing criminal charges. Around this time, YouTube was the wild, wild west and questionable pranks were dominating the platform. This raises the question, is it okay to film people without their knowledge and upload them to YouTube? That sounds a lot like a new form of emerging theft to me. Let's just call it privacy theft. During this wild phase of YouTube, meme culture established itself as the main language of the internet. Oftentimes, memes are screenshots from movies or TV shows and this, unfortunately, is where we are in content theft territory again. But one might argue that meme culture is an inherent function of our society. It's like telling a flower to stop growing because its expression is stealing space. 
an attempt to stop YouTubers from stealing content through the use of memes and basically kill the whole internet was posed by Article 13. The least tech-savvy politicians came together and created a draft that was supposed to be enforced by law. That, in summary, makes everybody being liable for everything. YouTube would be liable for its creator's uploads, therefore YouTube needs to implement upload filters. Everything a YouTuber does would be under surveillance, constantly demonetized or no more memes, no more remixes, no more internet culture. Article 13 sparked large debates and hundreds of thousands of protesters were on the streets every day. And the question to this day remains, memes, which are basically remixes, are they some sort of new creation? or should we treat them as a copyright infringement? This leads us to the one reason we YouTubers are still able to use copyrighted material regardless. It is the last string of a damaged rope that keeps everything together. Fair use is the rule that you may use copyrighted material if the whole project in itself can be seen as a new and transformational creation. Maybe, just maybe, copying others is an inherent function of humans. Babies do it, cats do it, companies do it, YouTubers do it. Maybe evolution is the ultimate copycat. When a new person is born, 99.999% of information is being copied and 0.001% of genetic information is absolutely new. We call this phenomenon mutation. Strangely enough, this ratio of mainly familiar information to small new mutation is what we people buy every day. Virgil Abloh knew this. He was the shoe designer of Kanye West and he made shoes that look 97% the same as all the other shoes you're already familiar with and 3% is something new, the mutation you've never seen before. And this formula made him rich. Across all life, this rule dominates how life progresses. And if that's true, then the state YouTube is in with people copying each other just reflects how living beings are. This would mean that all the drama, plagiarizing, copying and stealing would just be temporary noise. Even Beethoven or Mozart had to face accusations of plagiarism, but nature would dictate that true, timeless creation, whether that is music or a YouTube video, would withstand the test of time. People will remember many of Mozart's music in 200 years. Nobody will remember Mr. Beast's copycats. And maybe this is nature's way of self-regulation and who are we to intervene? The end of YouTube's renaissance age was about to be concluded with a bang. As I have mentioned earlier, there was a court case that would determine YouTube's future forever. If this court case would be lost, most YouTubers would have to pack their bags and end their career on the platform. It was just like cringe tube. H3H3 made a video in which they would react to Matt Hoss' parkour guy versus parkour girl video. They were taking him apart for making a cringe video that was so out of touch that it gained, rightfully so, quite a lot of attention. His reaction to that was to sue them for copyright infringement. And with that, all of YouTube's future was on the line. With many backs and forths and a lengthy legal battle, the case was ultimately decided in favor of H3H3. The court ruled that their video constituted fair use and dismissed Matt Hall's copyright infringement claims. The case became significant within the YouTube community as it set a precedent for the application of fair use in online content creation and commentary. And this meant that the last frontier of reaction channels and commentary channels was now defeated. And with that, we have entered the This one is where everything came crashing down. Let's not forget the malicious attack of the Wall Street Journal that left YouTube no choice but to implement a new version of their system to check for inappropriate content. This phase of YouTube was marked with unrighteous demonetization, a bunch of channels that got bullied out of the platform and a bunch of reaction channels that were gaming the system were now sitting at millions of subscribers. For the first time, real original channels started popping off and animation channels that took months to make those videos now finally had a chance to be seen. The question remains though, when does a piece of content cross the threshold of originality. In reaction channels like Sniper Wolf or XQC, there's barely any effort. Theoretically, having your face in one corner of the screen saying a few words makes the video kind of distinct from the original. But the question remains, is this enough? 
to be transformative? <laughs> Thanks to the H3 H3 case, these reaction channels are safe for now, but the question remains for how long. It is obvious that many people are starting to wake up to the fact that many of these reaction channels are lazy and blatantly steal other people's content. They start to understand that many low effort reaction channels simply exist to farm views of other people's content. It is just a matter of time when that is being reflected in a legal case with a verdict against reaction channels. What will those channels do once they will actually have to put work into their videos? My guess? they will vanish from the platform forever. And when that day happens, we will finally have an updated version. What it really means when a piece of content is deemed transformative. I think a transformative work comes from adding multiple distinct elements that in its entirety reflect a new and original creation that can't be easily replicated. Just like the iPhone. The iPhone copied the idea of a phone, an MP3 player, and an internet device. It puts all three together into one new distinct product that not just revolutionized the idea of what a phone can do, but also how intuitive such a device can be navigated. But what about cross-platform stealing? When you see a big trend on TikTok and you bring it to YouTube and be the first there, did you steal it? If that was the case, one could argue that the idea of Red Bull was stolen because Dietrich Mateschitz on a trip to Thailand discovered a drink called Krating Deng that he basically brought to the rest of the world. I mean, even the logo is nearly the same. So somehow the environment in which you release your creation seems to have an implication on the perception of creation versus theft. As you can see, the lines are blurry again. This leaves us with an ethical question. Should you ever legally protect your ideas? In the case of the Fine Bros, the answer is a loud and screaming no. But good creations, whether that is a YouTube video or a new invention, inspires and creates new art and inventions. That's why Elon Musk did not patent most of his significant inventions. It would have stifled further development of humanity. And with that in mind, maybe all ideas should be fully legally available for anyone. Because after all, it is human nature for people to copy and imitate things they like. And with this understanding of content theft, we have arrived at the modern age of YouTube. The content ID system is now intelligent and the YouTube audience is sophisticated enough to recognize when somebody stole content or ideas from other people. YouTube is in a schizophrenic state where on one end we see tons of new and original content while on the other end we see tons of regurgitated stuff that is either stolen from Mr. Beast or inspired by Iman Ghazi and Alexa Mosley. We're at an all-time high of Mr. Beast copycats in particular. We have channels like Stokes Twins that have multiple videos copied by him, Morgs, or the Russian channel A4 who blatantly said on Twitter after copying everything from Mr. Beast that he does it better. But even Mr. Beast draws his inspiration from other creators. Look, this one is clearly inspired by Mark Rober. No matter where you draw the line, everyone does it. Eventually, all the Mr. Beast copycats will move on and start copying the next big YouTube star. And maybe that's okay. But there's also a completely new way YouTubers are stealing or plagiarizing content and I haven't seen anybody voicing this perspective. Have you ever had that nagging feeling something's just not quite right? The wave of content that pretends to be human-made but is nothing else but ChatGPT copy-paste trash is higher than ever before. If you pretend like you are the originator of content that pretends to be human-made, it's just plagiarism with extra steps. We can see clearly that methods of extracting content has evolved over time. AI is a new Pandora's box. Yesterday we saw an AI-generated video of Will Smith eating spaghetti in a disturbing way and today we see incredible works of art. Now we have the means to create art with the push of a button. Literally. Let's admit it, we all would watch a fully AI-generated theater play. And, in fact... It has already happened. AI, when a robot writes a play, is one of the first theatrical experiments in the world conducted by the Czech theater company Studio Hirindu. In this project, an AI algorithm was used to generate dialogues and scenes based on input data from various sources, including plays, literature, and, and as interesting as it sounds for a one-time experience. Once you have seen it, 
Would you always want to see AI-generated content if you knew that a machine has created it? The future of YouTube is going to be interesting, to say the least. YouTube lives to fight for another day. The desire for personal gain will make creators more sophisticated to game the system over and over again. The latest way to plagiarize content is the use of AI-generated content pretending to be human-made. And I personally think this will be YouTube's biggest battle yet. To be completely honest, whenever I click on a video and have the impression that the video is written or voiced by AI, I leave the video immediately. I don't want to discriminate between human versus AI generated content, but I really, really don't appreciate it. I believe there will be a judgment day for reaction content. I watch from the sidelines and see a lot of pent up anger from the audience that has a deep content for those creators that don't add any value when they take other creators' content. YouTube audiences will eventually get even more sophisticated and the most valuable currency besides Bitcoin will be respect. And respect as a creator can only be earned through added value. The system of YouTube pushes creators to take the safe bet and copy thy neighbors. And it does not help that we as humans tend to not follow our intuition and just create the damn thing that your suppressed creativity wants you to express. So many pieces of art will never be made simply because that one teacher in school. And to be honest, it's a shame. I will always hate myself for not being naive enough to fly to Hollywood and just shoot that damn music video I was dreaming of this whole time. I guess the red-handed demon that was chasing me for years, the one that lives in all of us, has caught up to me to strike me down. After all, the path to greatness starts with imitation, but shall never end with theft. Imitating others for your own gains is simply human nature whether we imitate YouTubers, musicians or ideas. I guess the temptation to taste the forbidden fruit is just too damn high. Or maybe you should just get the fuck up, follow your intuition and finally create the damn thing you've been dreaming of this whole time. I'm gonna fuck you one this time. They say this is a perfect